gosh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Charlene. And I feel awful that I have to talk to you now at the end of a very long day when you must all be completely exhausted. Oh yeah. Okay. Everyone. Yeah. So you, you get a dinner when, when I'm done. You have to sit through this, but you'll get a dinner. And I want to say that I'm really happy to be doing this because actually I've been associated both with the CEU and the Vienna Institute. I was very involved when we set up with Vladimir Gligorov, the Balkan Observatory. So I'm just, so it's nice for me to be involved in both institutions. And as for going to Slovenia, I will admit to you all that I went to Yugoslavia at the age of 17 to build socialism. <laughs> and I worked on a road south of Belgrade. But what came out of that was actually nothing to do with socialism. There was a boy, an English boy there who came from Liverpool and taught us the Beatles songs. And it was before the Beatles had come out. So we all knew the Beatles songs long before anybody else. And <laughs> anyway, so actually, I'm going to be quite narrow, Shalini, though I'm happy to talk about levels and also gender, because I think it's very involved in uh, what I'm going to talk about. But I really want to talk quite narrowly about restructuring military power. Um, so the topic that Shalini gave me was human security in an insecure world. And what is very interesting is that NATO has adopted the language of human security in its new strategic concept. And it's not only it's right up there at the beginning and it says human security applies to all our core areas, collective defense, uh, crisis management and cooperative security, but they've continued to emphasize it. So if you hear Stoltenberg, the secretary general speak, they will go on saying human security is really important. And so the question is, what on earth does this mean? Is it co-option? Does it mean I've got to give up on human security and talk about something else? Or is it serious? And that's really what I would like to um, focus on now. And, and I suppose my big question is, so yesterday, Putin announces a partial mobilization and quite clearly threatens the use of nuclear weapons. He says he's going to have referendums on um, the territories of Donetsk and Luhansk. And once they're Russian territory, it's Russian military doctrine to use nuclear weapons in the event of an attack on Russian territory. So it's a very alarming moment. So isn't this very peculiar for in this context for NATO to start talking about human security? Shouldn't it be as Ivan Krastev said this morning, sort of hard-nosed geopolitical at this point. So that's my big question for the lecture. So what I want to do is to put forward a vision of what I think NATO ought to be meaning <laughs> um, and what this implies for the future of NATO. And I want to suggest that the shift from national security to human security must also involve a shift from a world organized on a geopolitical basis. In other words, by geopolitics, underlying the idea of geopolitics is the idea of war, that great powers go to war with each other, to a rights-based international law system. That's what I how I really understand human security. And that doesn't mean the end of military power, but it means using military power in quite different ways. Ivan Krastev said this morning, well, now suddenly Europe's realized military power matters. Yes, it does matter, but not in the classic war fighting ways uh, that used to be typical of NATO. And that's 
really why I thought I would be very Eurocentric, focus on this question, but I'll try to bring in wider questions later on. And I, the way I'm going to address that is first by giving you a thumbnail sketch of the kind of evolution of human security and my understanding of human security. Then I'm gonna give you a thumbnail sketch of what uh, Shalini already alluded to, the changing nature of warfare. <laughs> And then I'll come back to NATO and Europe. So, you know, the standard narrative about human security is it all began with UNDP's Human Development Report of 1994, when UNDP put forward the idea of human security. It had seven different concepts of human security, environmental, economic, I can't remember what they all were. And only one was personal security. And the basic idea of UNDP, it was that people die from poverty and disease. And actually, if we used all the money that went into the arms race on development, this would mean an end to war. And it came out of a whole tradition in the 70s and 80s, the Brandt Report, the Brundtland Report, that were all arguing we've got to divert resources from the arms race to development. So that was the beginning. But then you had the Canadians and the Australians taking up the concept of human security. And they focused very much on physical security. It was the time of the Bosnian War. So for them, if, if for UNDP, human security was about human development, for Canada and particularly Lloyd Axworthy, it was about human rights. And it ended up being the need to use military force in the context of ethnic cleansing, genocide, and massive violations of human rights. And it ended up as responsibility to protect. So for a long time, there was a big debate between these two versions that were known as the narrow and the broad version. And that was supposedly reconciled in the Ogata Sen Commission, which said human security is about both human rights and human development, but it's about the downside risks of both. So it's about responding to emergencies, whether they're wars or disasters or whatever. Now, more interesting for our purposes, which is what I'm going to talk about now, is what, how it has evolved, uh, first within the European Defence and Security Policy, ESDP, and secondly, even more interestingly, within various militaries. The British military, very committed to this, um, the Dutch military, and even the French military. <laughs> so not so much the Americans, but the Americans seem to be on board for this NATO change. But anyway, so I want to tell you a little bit about each because I think that's what's much more relevant for what's happening within NATO. So in the case of ESDP, actually I was very involved in this because I convened a study group in the early 2000s that that reported to Javier Solana, who was then the high representative for common foreign and security policy. And it was about what kind of, if, if Europe was now to begin. If you remember, there was this meeting between Blair and Mitterrand in Saint Malo after Kosovo, where they decided there had to be a European defense policy. <laughs> and so the objective was to try to think what should that defense policy cap be? And we had a group that involved academics, but also practitioners, generals, former defense ministers. It was a really interesting experience. And we came up with something called a human security doctrine for Europe. And actually that human security doctrine has remained, it's in the strategic compass, it's in the global strategy. And I could go into details about how it's evolved, but I just want to tell you just a few points that are key to understanding what it was about. Of course, Europe's external policy was about crisis management. It was very much shaped by the experience of the Yugoslav wars. 
And it was about European intervention in wars in Africa, in the Middle East. And so it was about what could under a UN, within a UN framework. So it was about international intervention where the aim is to dampen down violence. And I think what was radical about it, we, we came up with the idea that Europe should have a civil military human security service and that civil military emphasis still continues and that it would be guided by certain principles that were different from classic war fighting principles. And I'm not gonna give you all the principles, but I just want to mention two. The first, which is the most important was human rights. What does human rights mean? It means that you have to take saving lives before targeting enemies. <laughs> if you're in a military situation and you can't attack an enemy without killing civilians, you don't attack. And this was actually, I mean, a very good example for me was the British in Belfast. They couldn't bomb IRA hideouts in Belfast because Belfast was full of British citizens. Uh, whereas they felt no, no sense of impunity bombing people in Afghanistan or Aden or wherever they were, but they couldn't do it in Britain. So human security was doing things like that. It was recognizing that not killing, that that comes, you can't have such a thing as collateral damage. And the other thing is that your aim isn't to win. And I'll come back to this over and over again. Your aim is to dampen down violence. So these were the two kind of key principles that were involved in what we meant by human security approach. Um, now, let me turn to the other issue, which is the evolution within militaries. And um, I think what's happened, I think Afghanistan was hugely important for European militaries and the experience of Afghanistan. And I think there's, there was, from the last few years, a growing emphasis on the protection of civilians. And this partly came out of pressure from civil society groups, but it partly came out of the recognition by commanders that if they killed civilians, they were weakening their own legitimacy. And this was hugely problematic. What actually happened was though, and this is what, I mean, I've talked to the British military. I don't know if the American military see it the same way. So for the last few years, and if you look at the UN statistics on the civilian casualties, what you'll see happened in uh, Afghanistan was that nearly all the civilian casualties were caused by Taliban attacks and not by NATO attacks. But as far as ordinary Afghans were concerned, this didn't make much difference because if the US bombed a military target, the Taliban responded by killing civilians. <laughs> so they saw NATO by sustaining the war through their continuous airstrikes as contributing to civilian casualties. And so it didn't really solve the problem. And that's what I think came as an understanding on the part of the British military. So there was lots of pressure from civil society groups on a whole range of issues. And it's really odd. I did an interview just two weeks ago with some people in shape, which is NATO's military headquarters. And they said, oh, we're gonna give you lots of further contacts to talk to. And they sent me their list of contacts and they were all NGOs, not people inside NATO. So there's been a long discussion. And so there's a whole set of issues which have been put together under the rubric of human security. So the it, obviously protection of civilians is one, and NATO has developed a formal policy on protection of civilians, but there's protection of cultural heritage. There's the women, peace and security agenda, which they put a lot of emphasis on. There's dealing with gender related violence. There's dealing with human trafficking. There's something they call building integrity, which means anti-corruption. And these are all elements 
that have been put under the umbrella. So NATO last year established a human security unit that put all these things under an umbrella and the British Ministry of Defence and the Dutch Ministries of Defence have done the same thing. So I spent quite a lot of time trying to find out does human security just mean these bundle of things, which are good, really good in themselves, so it's a great improvement if they do them, or does it mean something more than that? And I don't yet know the answer, <laughs> but let me tell you broadly what, how I understand, what I understand human security is something more than that. So first of all, I think human security is what we enjoy in law rights-based, I stress rights-based law-governed societies like Austria or the UK, even if there are some violations of human rights. And in such a society, we take it for granted that if there's a crisis, a terrorist attack, a fire, uh, a flood, a famine, <laughs> there are emergency services, there are police, firefighters, medical personnel who will come to our aid. And I see human security as being the externalization of that. It's that on a global scale. So that's one element. But part of that does include the military. But it includes the military operating in a very different way. And that links to what I was saying earlier about the protection of civilians. And the best way I can find of explaining it to you is I don't know how many of you are familiar with international humanitarian law or the laws of war, but all militaries follow international humanitarian law. That's what makes a soldier different from a criminal because they're operating legally. And according to international humanitarian law, in a war situation, you're allowed to kill civilians provided it's necessary to achieve the military objective that you're aiming at and provided that military, the victory that will result from reaching that military objective is proportionate to the number of civilians killed. That's the rule in international humanitarian law. I could, there's lots more details. What I've been trying to say to is that in human security, it's exactly the other way around. You are sometimes allowed to kill enemies or even maybe to arrest them, that would be better, <laughs> but only if it's necessary to protect civilians. And that is a, requires a real mind shift on the part of soldiers who've been taught to fight and win. And um, it also requires a difference in how you organize and equip military force. So having said this, having gone through my quick sketch of human security, let me just say something about the changing nature of war. Um, and in case what I've said sounds amazingly utopian. Um, so I think the biggest lesson we learn from the Ukraine war, and it is a lesson that we should have learned from Korea, we should have learned from Vietnam, we should have learned from Iraq, we should have learned from Afghanistan, is that wars can no longer be won. It's because of the increased destructiveness of all military technology, including the sort of vernacular technologies used by insurgents or local guerrilla groups. Um, the problem is what Wars can be hugely destructive, but they can't do what Thomas Schelling, the American strategist, called compellence. You can't use the military to make the other side do what you want to do, which was, in Clausewitz's term, the aim of war. And the problem nowadays is that if you have a contest between militaries, there's a problem of escalation because if you go on escalating the way Clausewitz said you should escalate, if you go on escalating in order to win, there's a risk of annihilation. Um, on the other hand, if you continue 
you turn war into something else. So, and, and this is what I want to say something about, which is that it doesn't mean the end of war, but it means the role of military force or violence is very different. It means that what we see in different parts of the world are wars that seem to have no end. That's what Charlene referred to. They're wars in which the aim is not actually winning or losing. They're wars in which the various warring parties gain from violence itself. And they either gain in political terms, they might ferment ethnic hatred and sectarianism uh, and underpin an extremist ideology, or they gain directly in economic terms from loot and pillage, from smuggling under the cover of war, from setting up checkpoints, taking hostages, from taxing humanitarian aid. And in these wars, actually battles between the warring parties are very, very rare. Most of the violence is directed against civilians. Um, and so the typical features of these wars, looting, sexual violence, destruction of cultural property, these are what these wars are like. And I mean, I talk about them, I could go on at great length, but I don't want to, um, as, in a way, a sort of social condition, a sort of new ism. You could call it a kind of militarized neoliberalism, if you like, where violence is a method of um, shaping social relations, of allocating resources, and where it's continually reproduced. And that's the sort of situation we see now in Syria, Afghanistan, Congo, Sudan. Um, and I think another important point is that these wars, interestingly, very often have started with democracy protests. And if you like, these kinds of wars are an alternative to democracy. They're a way of suppressing democracy, of channeling democratic demands into ethnic conflict. Um, so let me just, so having said that kind of description, how do we talk about Ukraine? What sort of war? are we seeing in Ukraine? Um, well, I think this was always Putin's objective. Putin wanted what I call a new war, an intractable war on Europe's doorstep. It was a way of ending democracy demands in Ukraine. And actually, if you go back to 2013, some of you may be familiar with an article written by his chief of staff, Gerasimov, on nonlinear war, where he talks about a new type of war and says how easy it is to destabilize a country with political technology, we know what that means, uh, special forces and, lo and mobilizing local dissidents. And that's really what actually happened six months later <laughs> in, I mean, actually I, I've traveled all the way through Southern Ukraine and so many, Russian, ordinary Russian citizens were very proud of the fact that they thwarted attempts to capture administrative buildings in the South. And Russia only actually succeeded in Donetsk and Luhansk. So I think you can say that Putin, from the start, his position was typical of the new wars. It, the regimes are nearly always the sort of regimes that Charlene says are a mixture of crony capitalism, <laughs> ethnic nationalism and toxic masculinity. Putin is typical of that. He's used war since the beginning as his way of sustaining power, starting with Chechnya, then Georgia, then Syria, and now Ukraine. And if you look at the methods, that there seems to be systematic looting, systematic sexual violence, all of the things that are characteristic of new wars. Um, but Ukraine's different, and that's what makes it so significant. Um, 
from the Ukraine perspective, it's much more like a classic class Fitzian war. They are really trying to resist Russian aggression. They're really trying to win. And for them, it's a contest between democracy and this kind of criminalized ethnic regime that characterizes Russia. But my big question is, how long can this be sustained? This is the problem that we face. Because um, on the one hand, we're really facing a real danger of escalation. What kind of happens <laughs> when Russia starts escalating the way I talked about at the beginning? Uh, on the other hand, and that could be a consequence of Ukraine doing really well. It's already a consequence of Ukraine doing really well. On the other hand, if Ukraine doesn't do really well, it can turn into the kind of intractable conflict. You know, there will be hatred against Russians because of what's happened. Uh, everybody has been given weapons. There's 35% unemployment. There's falls in wages. It's beyond belief that people will actually resist <laughs> from starting to get engaged in criminal activities to acquire money. So, you know, we face this really terrible choice. Some people say negotiations. I just, I'm not going to go into negotiations. We can, but actually in most new wars, there almost always are negotiations and they don't really solve the problem. They create a kind of, they're a little bit better than outright war. But if you think about the, Balkans, if you think about uh, the South Caucasus, if you think about Congo, Sudan, they create a long-term no war, no peace situation. So they don't, re they entrench the criminalized elite. So it's not really a solution. Top-down negotiations, maybe humanitarian negotiations are really helpful, like ending the blockade or local agreements, but that's a Sorry, I'm going on to, I, I keep getting diverted. So it's really, I mean, the only good option one can think of is uh, the collapse of Putin, which is on the table, of course, and the reaction of soldiers, which is already happening um, every day. And there's so many soldiers who don't want to fight. They ran away, basically. So there is a possibility that that will happen, but it's very unpredictable. But that's the only good option, I think. So let me now come to the last part. Have I gone on too long? I'll come to the last part <laughs> and come back to NATO and Europe and human security and what it means. So at the end of the Cold War, many of us hoped that both NATO and the Warsaw Pact would be dissolved and instead we would have a pan-European security system based on the Helsinki principles. It was Gorbachev's common European home, it was Palmer's common security. And um, I think what's really interesting is that I think the Helsinki Agreement was actually the first expression of human security. We didn't use that term now, but the three fundamental principles, which were territorial status quo, a non-use of force across borders, economic and social cooperation, and respect for human rights, I think you could argue those three principles actually amounted to what I describe as human security. Now, of course, that didn't happen. OSC, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe was established, but it was really marginalized. And the Warsaw Pact was dissolved, but NATO expanded. Now, I do think NATO expansion was a mistake, though I don't think it explains Putin's behavior. <laughs> I think it's a pretext. But the reason I think it was a mistake is that NATO remained a classic geopolitical warfighting institution. And as long as you're a classic geopolitical warfighting institution, then anybody outside feels threatened. 
it's just part of the story. And um, actually, I was going to say that if we do think the West is responsible for Putin, it's for a completely another reason, which was this dramatic shock therapy and recipe for neoliberalism and privatization that produced the kind of crony capitalism and oligarchy. That's much more an explanation that there you can blame the West much more than NATO expansion, but it's another topic. Um, so I think what's really interesting and what's happening now is that the European pillar of NATO is becoming more important. And with the addition of Sweden and Finland, um, it's, that's that sort of adds to that. And so the question is, if the European pillars become more important and ESDP is a sort of human security approach in contrast to NATO, does that mean that NATO is going to shift to become a little bit more like what we would have liked to see in a Helsinki type arrangement that um, eventually could include a democratic yet yeah, Russia? So I think that's the question. And let me just say what I think that means in concrete terms. So in concrete terms, first of all, I think it means a change in the collective defense posture. Uh, what it means is something that oddly enough was greatly discussed in the 1980s when we were all against nuclear weapons was the idea of deterrence through effective conventional defense rather than deterrence through the threat of retaliation. You know, if Putin had anticipated how effective the Ukrainians would have been, were at defending Ukraine, would he have ever invaded? And I think that's the idea that we, that what it means is, is a real shift. I mean, NATO always say, oh, but we are defensive, but we're, if, if attacked, we're going to send a cruise missile into Russian territory. Well, it's a change in that attitude. It's saying that collective defense needs a really effective, so it might need an increase in military spending on conventional defense in what are called the frontline states, the Baltic states, Poland, and so on. But it's conventional. It's, it's deterrence through defense rather than deterrence through retaliation. And there's quite a lot of writing now about that, but there was a lot of writing about it in the 1980s. I just got out of the library a pugwash volume called The Foundations of Defensive Deterrence. <laughs> um, and it's very close actually to Gorbachev's concept of reasonable sufficiency. So when Gorbachev came to power, he was very influenced by all these pugwash types. And the idea of reasonable sufficiency is that in order to deter an attack, you don't need to be able to kill the world several times over. So he announced this policy of reasonable sufficiency that enabled him to sign all these arms control arrangements with the West. So I think it needs a, a change in posture. And I suspect that is already being discussed in NATO, but I haven't been able to find it all out. But there's this new model force, which I think is going to be much more on these lines. And the second thing is, of course, a change in crisis management, which is something that all these guys are very keen on, <laughs> the military. And, um, and basically what it means is that in places like Afghanistan or Mali or wherever they're involved, instead of an emphasis on counter-terror, the emphasis is on protection of civilians, the military role in monitoring and upholding local agreements, which is actually very interesting. Um, establishing humanitarian space, safe havens, humanitarian corridors, documenting war crimes, arresting war criminals, these kinds of activities. So let me just say finally, how is this relevant to Ukraine? <laughs> um, so I think one can argue 
that the war in Ukraine is about protecting people. It's about protecting Ukrainian civilians. Um, and I think what you're seeing in the, that the West is now walking a tightrope between supporting Ukrainian resistance and not escalating the war. And, you know, I've been reading so much recently about the discussions in the Biden administration about what to do in the event of Putin using a nuclear weapon. And there seems to be a general consensus that you should not have a nuclear response, that Putin should be isolated, China, even India, the rest of the world will all condemn Putin for breaking a taboo, so the response should not be nuclear. And then there's a discussion about what kind of civilian response there should be. Should it be a cyber attack? Should I don't know. It, the discussion goes on. But that just illustrates the point that I'm really making is that it is a shift away from the assumption that you simply fight a war, <laughs> that you try to find ways to dampen down violence. But along with that approach, and I think that's what's missing at the moment, but that is implicit in a human security approach, is that there has to be an economic and social approach. There has to be a change. You know, what the West really could be doing was pushing Ukraine away from the, I mean, I can't believe that a few weeks ago, Ukraine passed the most neoliberal labor law imaginable. So actually, there ought to be lots of pressure on Ukraine to develop a kind of war economy, to have much greater state intervention, uh, to have much greater social provision. At the moment, all of that is being provided by voluntary efforts by civil society. And Ukraine has one of the most active civil societies in the world. But it can't be sustained over the long term. It's ridiculous to have an un unemployment in the middle of a war effort. So you need, I mean, I know war economies look rather like communist economies, but nevertheless, that's something that needs to happen. And it also, wars have also been ways of dealing with corruption. And there is some evidence that that's already happening, that some of the assets of the Ukrainian oligarchs have already been nationalized. Um, and they've introduced some degree of judicial reform. So these are the kinds, so it could become a kind of model for an alternative approach to neoliberalism. And of course, the other thing is what about Russia? And what about the sanctions? And I think the big problem with the sanctions, I mean, of course I was in favor of them. You had to express your outrage but they are such blanket sanctions. And the risk is, up till now, they haven't really felt the effect, but the risk is, as was the case in Iraq, as was the case in Syria, as was the case in Venezuela, that it's gonna be ordinary people who really feel the effects and that might make, and that the story can be spun that this is the West's fault <laughs> rather than the government's fault. And I think that really needs to be rethought how you do in all of these places, Iraq, Venezuela, Syria, the warlords, even if they're targeted, are just so brilliant at finding ways around sanctions. Since they're totally criminal, they don't mind. Oh, they're up to all kinds of tricks. It's always the ordinary people who suffer and it actually contributes to further fragmentation and criminalization. And the other thing that I think is really important, and it's a whole nother lecture, is where I do think we need blanket sanctions is on oil and gas. <laughs> and that means not going to Saudi Arabia, but it means a dramatically increased program of renewable energy and energy efficiency. And this is what we, I mean, I think, and this is my real sort of last substantial point, and then I'll conclude. Um, we are reaching the end of the Soviet and American model of development in which the key core factor of production was oil. And the huge price of oil is a reflection of the exhaustion of those models. And basically, it's not just the problem that oil's bad for the climate, 
It's the problem that the oil upholds rich dictators, it finances rich dictators, and it really skews the whole global economy. So that's, I mean, that would be another lecture, but that's just the key point I want to say. So are these changes that I've proposed, oh gosh, on the cards? Well, I thought I'd give you two quotes. I mean, one was for, from a senior Ukrainian official, a senior NATO official, sorry, a senior NATO official. And I said to him, why are you so keen on human security? I would have thought the Russian invasion of Ukraine would make you think differently. And he said, absolutely not. Ukraine has been a wake up call for us. What we realized was that NATO planning was based on a war which if actually carried out would involve millions of civilian casualties and we just can't do that anymore. So that's one. The other is the British military when I was asking them about it and they said it's all about our legitimacy. We're not like the Russians. We're different. We're heroes. We, we want to be a force for good and it's how they see their own identity. So I think these are two interesting straws in the wind, but against that, of course, you have huge vested interests in um, production and trade of military equipment, uh, in continued fossil fuel. I mean, we're up against huge vested interests. So it, um, and of course, something we've discussed the last few days, sort of, authoritarian regimes and crony capitalism that we don't really know how to deal with, how to manage, how to reduce. So, you know, the jury's out on the future. But I just wanted to make one very last point. And, and actually, I've, I didn't make the point I was going to, I was going to try and bring in civil society in the world, but I'm not going to have time. But what I did want to say is that in the past, in modern history, major wars like the Napoleonic Wars or the wars of the mid 19th century or the 20th century wars have been moments of dramatic restructuring. They've been moments when in order to win, they've been existential moments when in order to win, the winning nations had to introduce really large scale reforms, whether it was civil rights in the Napoleonic Wars, whether it was the abolition of serfdom and in the Habsburg and Russian empires and the introduction of the suffrage in Germany and, and the ab abolition of slavery in America in the mid 19th century wars, or whether it was the welfare state and social redistribution in the 20th century wars. And the problem is we can't have that kind of war. What winning would mean in this context would be the end of war. <laughs> And that's actually really difficult, really fundamental, but I think it's actually a precondition for everything else that needs to happen. And that's where I'll end. I'll let Charlene. But we go to this small uh, group of women, but also to shift our discussion to women as a nation. So let me just say about dividends first. <laughs> dividends in the WTS, number one, so it's the less than point for the line. So it's not for the line, it's for the line. This is very important. But for the line in seven years. I think there was a back history. So I think those who know how to get there to collect the wood, no? But no, other people are getting access, no? So I was just going to say that the continued conversation 
center or we can just take a good leading version. anti-nuclear activist in Canada back in the 1970s and 80s. But um, uh, I have a question about soldiers um, and, and how soldiers fit in your, your story. I, I heard uh, an interview with Wesley Clark just about a week ago on the economy, one of the Economist podcasts. And he said, uh, our, our soldiers are civilians too, and they have families and they have, and that's, that the, there's been a change in sensibility somehow from the imagery of, let's say, the Vietnam War GI to the traumatized Afghan uh, veteran. And the military has some, there's been a sea change there. I, I, and well, just your thoughts on, on that. And then I have a million other questions. That's what I was trying to say to you, actually. I think. I think it happened earlier in the British case because of the experience of Northern Ireland. Right. But Northern Ireland was the case of the civilians who did Yeah, I mean, there was, I, I had a wonderful quote from a British soldier in Northern Ireland who said, we realized this wasn't Aden. <laughs> we couldn't just kill people. So we had to act differently. But I think there's more than that. Um, I'm, I'm really struck because this has come from the soldiers, at least in the British case. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've been invited to Sandhurst and to discuss these things because the British are very proud of being a thinking army. And actually, I did a long interview with the, the group of people in the Ministry of Defence just in July. Uh, on what they thought about human security. That's where that quote came about, it's our legitimacy. Uh, but it was sort of really interesting because I asked them how did they understand human security and to my surprise, they produced the UNDP definition. And they said, well, when we're in crisis situations, we ought to be looking at the whole situation. We ought to be understanding the economic situation and the social situation of people and not just the military situation. And that's what we failed to understand. And when I said, because the British are playing a very major role in training the Ukrainians. So I said, well, do you think that it, it is the approach in Ukraine, human security? And to my surprise, they came up with well, we're very worried about the economic impact on ordinary Russians. We don't think that's human security, which really surprised me. So I, I'd like to talk to, I mean, they say that the Dutch are very close to them. And it's interesting, by the way, because I think human security, um, maybe this is me being totally, I don't know, attributing things to END and the Helsinki Citizens Assembly, but it was Holland and Britain, you know, and there's this Interchurch Peace Council that really uh, adopted human security at an early stage. So I'm wondering if that story doesn't come out of civil society. But the French also are very keen on human security and have something in their Ministry of Defense. I mean, the Americans much less so. That's the interesting thing, and um, I was going to say an interesting move of what I think that I, I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but just that the soldiers that have been traumatized by having been really trust, and that's now come back inside the military itself. I mean, oh, that well, I do occasionally uh, talk at American military colleges. And there's, often, there's a lot of interest in all this. Uh, so I do think, but they don't have that whole language which the Europeans and the Canadians actually have developed. But they're still kind of, you know, everybody has been, I think, traumatized by the experience of both Iraq and Afghanistan. And then there was an interesting moment in Iraq when Petraeus did population security in Baghdad. And that was actually a sort of human security approach in that what he did was he stationed American soldiers in Iraqi security stations 
And actually what they did was to make some 300 local agreements. And of course it was a moment when the Sunnis were fed up with Al Qaeda. So they were ready to do that, but it needed an agent to do that. I mean, the problem with Petraeus was that he had this whole theory of separating the reconcilables from the irreconcilables. And they were similar, they were at the same time running, it was the first sort of targeted drone attacks. Were they drones or cruise missiles at that stage? I can't remember, but under McChrystal in Ambar province, which is where Al Qaeda was based. And I think that was the origin of ISIS. So he was doing bad things at the same time. And the same thing happened in Afghanistan. He, you know, he shifted from population security to kill or capture. And that's the real problem is the attacking. Just, you can't, anyway. But it's a fascinating question, and I think it really is, you know, we are living in a world where, in, in Europe and America, where we've got used to peace, and the soldiers have also got used to peace. Well, I'm hesitant to not prolong it, but I'm just asking a question which I'm sure you've been asked before. How does it work when only one side adopts a military doctrine uh, on the basis of uh, human rights um, and not the other side, yeah? So if there's an asymmetry, and I was just wondering, does it only work when that side which adopts it has much more resources <laughs> to compensate I in a way for the other point. side? Yeah. I think that in most outer barrier operations, I mean, that was what happened in Afghanistan. They didn't really have enough resources. So when the Taliban attacked them, they counterattacked. If they'd had more resources, they wouldn't have needed to counterattack. And, you know, there were a lot of debates about that. So you do need resources. But, it, you know, there's a very, it's awfully difficult. You know, it sounds as though I'm saying two quite distinct things. But if you think about Ukraine and what's happening, um, yes, the Ukrainians are protecting civilians, but they're killing Russians like anything. Can that be called human rights? I mean, I don't think there's any alternative to what they're doing. It is defensive. Um, but, you know, at what point do you say this is completely unacceptable? And I think that's, that's really difficult. So the whole point is that if you're upholding human rights, you're trying to prevent genocide, you're trying to prevent war. But it's sometimes you know, at what point does it, and, and that's the really difficult thing, and that's what's difficult about Ukraine. It is a sort of tightrope, as I said, between, you know, trying to stop Russian advances, but not escalating. So it's sort of somewhere between, I mean, I keep saying it's somewhere between policing. Policing is about upholding the law and human rights in a, in a human rights-based society, but it's somewhere between policing and the military, so it's quite a difficult one to tread. Tatiana Bogdan from Ukraine, I have a very small question. <laughs> uh, in your speech, you mentioned that um, NATO extension, it was like a mistake uh, that uh, uh, pushed Russia to perceive that uh, NATO is like a threat to the national security and promoted uh, Putin invasion of Ukraine? No, 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 no. no. I, didn't say no. I completely okay. didn't say that. I'm sorry. I said I think it was a mistake, but I don't think it can explain what okay. Putin did. It provided Putin with an argument. Putin could say, look at horrible NATO, but no, I don't think that. Uh, okay, I agree with you, but uh, don't you see? If, uh, for instance, uh, NATO had not accepted Baltic states uh, or Southern European states, uh, to NATO mem members said uh, in this case, uh, next target to Putin's invasion could be one of Baltic states or Moldova and Romania. Well, I think that, because... I do think that. I mean, I, and I do think NATO provides some protection. So, you know, that has absolutely do think that. I think it's good. Now I think it's good. I mean, at the time I didn't because I wanted a different. What I wanted was before Russia became so horrible, <laughs> I wanted a different kind of pan-European security system. And the great advantage of NATO, 
is that if you're inside NATO, you never go to war with another NATO member. And, uh, you know, that is a huge... Uh, who, what? Oh, Turkey and Greece, absolutely right. So I'm wrong about that. I'm completely wrong. Yeah, you're right. They haven't gone to war yet. Uh, but, um, well, there have been Russians. There was in Cyprus. But the point, um, you know, so I'm not saying that, it, you know, and, and now we can look at the situation and say, you know, as many countries as possible should join NATO to prevent a Russian aggression. But I think that the expansion of NATO, there, it was re a real problem that NATO was a war-fighting institution. And what we need is something much more human rights-based than war-fighting. That's what I'm trying to say. So um, that's why I think it was a mistake. I wanted a different kind of European security system. Uh, much more like the European Union's external policy than like NATO. NATO was based on the idea of fighting World War II or the Cold War all over again. So, I, you know, I'm not for a minute saying that NATO, it's on the contrary, I'm saying NATO expansion had nothing to do with Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I, I have a question uh, regarding exactly that point that you raised about the future of uh, European security architecture. Uh, do you believe that this is to be revived with OSC Helsinki Accords, or this is irreversibly, uh, you know, damaged uh, with? Because I just one point that you made in your presentation, your speech. You raised uh, the question of geopolitics, which I very much agree. This is language of geopolitics is uh, war, war language. And with, uh, with the change of leadership in Russia, you probably, if I remember correctly, you said that that would be repairable in a way. Mm, do you be, do you, could you yeah, like say mean, that you really time, believe that? <laughs> In the 1990s, I said it could be either OSCE or Russia could be allowed to join NATO. That was, I said, if Russia joins NATO, then it becomes a different kind of organization and it becomes the military underpinning of OSCE. And that would have given OSCE more teeth than it had. So that's a real possibility. I mean, that's a real possibility. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I mean, it, and one could imagine similar region. I mean, the African Union is quite similar in the OAS. You can imagine regional organizations that are very much linked to the United Nations. It sounds very utopian, but I don't see any alternative in the current. No, I would just say we need Russia as part of the security system, but what it takes for Russia Oh, yeah. Well, it's nowhere near now. And we don't know what happens. I mean, I think I, I was listening to a, uh, a Guardian podcast, actually, where Luke Harding, the journalist, was saying, uh, if this was a Shakespearean play, this is Act 5, Scene 1. And in Scene 3, Putin falls. So um, uh, I think there's something in that. But the question is, what happens when he falls? Does it become a democracy or does these awful fascists who are arguing for full mobilization, take, who takes over? We don't know.